Okay, thank you very much everyone for joining, uh, joining us here today. We'll be speaking with uh, a couple of guys from Epsilon to recap some of the announcements from reInvent just a couple of weeks ago. So before we start, I just want to go through some introductions of everyone that's on the call today. We have Ran Ribbonsaft, who's the CTO of Epsigon. We have Hen Peretz, the software engineer from Epsigon. We also have Matt Martinez, a cloud content and labs QA engineer from here at Cloud Academy, and myself, Stuart Scott, and I'm the content and security lead here at Cloud Academy. It's so a thanks very much, everyone, for joining. Yeah, our pleasure to join as well. I think reInvent this year has been very uh, magnificent. Lots of cool features. I think each one is in in his own field, but uh, you know, let's uh, let's review them one by one. <laughs> we'll try and get through as many as we can, at least. <laughs> okay, so here is our agenda for today. As you can see, there's uh, about 30 or so different announcements that we're going to run through, um, covering lots of different categories, such as database, compute, security, machine learning, analytics, etc. So there, there's quite a lot to get through here today. So I'm just going to kick off straight away. And I think we're going to start with database um, announcements and services. So as we go through this, each one of us will, will talk about one of the announcements on screen and then it will pass on to another announcement. So, so let's start with the Amazon managed Apache Cassandra service. Yes, perfect. So uh, the Amazon managed Apache Cassandra service, uh, I think is this an, an exciting uh, announcement and I, I didn't really expect that simply because I'm keeping also with a lot of people that, uh, you know, trying to do the migration to AWS and uh, you know how hard it is to actually uh, move your database or do any configuration with the database. It's sort of like a pain point com most company has. So Amazon, what they did is that they just um, uh, built their serverless Apache Cassandra compatible database service. It's uh, basically, uh, if you think about it, it's just similar as as DynamoDB in terms of the NoSQL. And what it means for uh, for people is that they don't need to actually change anything in how they work through Cassandra. It's all uh, uh, compatible. So I think it's pretty nice and it can help people to migrate a lot faster. Um, the second announcement on a database is, um, is the Amazon RDS proxy. What it basically means is that uh, there is now a database proxy which is fully managed by, uh, by Amazon and gives you access to the RDS. So uh, for those of you who have been using RDS like with Lambda functions, you know that um, Lambda functions are informal. So if you need to be able to talk with your uh, RDS, you're going to start to creating connections and monitor them and sort of like putting that in the, uh, in the container state. And, this is sort of a, a bad practice because you keep constantly monitoring connections. So using the RDS proxy just eliminates that need. And I think it's very wonderful to, to have the ability to use that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellent. <clears throat> now we're going to move on to some of the AWS compute services. I want to start with AWS Outposts. And th this service is all about hybrid functionality. It helps you to align your applications and infrastructure from your on-premises environment with that of the AWS cloud. And this was actually announced uh, the previous year's reInvent, but it's now generally available. So this is available for us to use now. So what AWS Outposts allows us to do is essentially bring the AWS cloud to your own data center. And it uses the very same hardware as AWS uses. So by bringing in AWS hardware to your data center, it allows you to use native AWS services, including the same tools and APIs, as you would when running your infrastructure within AWS itself. The difference being is that the hardware and services will be running locally to help you maintain latency and compliance for local applications and workloads. And to use an organized AWS outpost for your use in your data center, you can simply order them through the AWS management console. And here you have the option of selecting different compute and storage options that are available and depending on how much hardware you need, you can simply order a single server if you need just a single server or variants of rack sizes, including a quarter rack, half rack, or, or even a full size rack of equipment. From a, from a technical perspective, there's a, a wide number of EC2 instances available. 
as well as storage options for EPS volumes and local instance storage. And Outpost also allows you to run services such as EC2, ECS, EBS, DKS, RDS, and EMR. And there is going, going to be many more to come as well. And what, one final point on Outpost before we move on is that the service itself is fully managed. And this means that you do not need to maintain any kind of level of patch management across your infrastructure. AWS will ensure the infrastructure is patched as and when needed. The, the second compute announcement is AWS Compute Optimizer. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, there, there are two main goals of the AWS Compute Optimizer, and these being both to optimize performance and costs across your compute infrastructure running in AWS. The service itself is backed by machine learning to help identify patterns and historical data to better recommend alternate compute instances, which there are now over 140 choices to choose from. So it can sometimes be pretty difficult to get this right the first time. And by using the compute optimizer, it will prevent you from underutilizing resources, leading to an increased cost on your behalf, or overutilizing resources, which will of course lead to performance and other potential issues going forward. The service will use 14 days worth of historical data from Amazon CloudWatch and will look at CPU utilization, memory utilization and network IO metrics to help the service determine its recommendations by using this data. Now, when the service generates its recommendations, it will deploy which it will sorry, display which instances are under provisioned, over provisioned and which ones are optimized as they should be. Of the instances that are recommended, uh, Compute Optimizer will provide three different options. And this allows you to see graphically a comparison against your current instance type, allowing you to determine the best option available to you. So you still have some flexibility on the final choice you make if you would like to change the instance type. Uh, again, this service comes free. There's no additional cost to using this. You simply have to opt into the service for it to start collecting data. And if your account is a part of an organization, then you can configure all your member accounts to be set up for compute optimizer at the same time, which is great. Next, we have EC2 Image Builder. And as the name implies, it's used to help manage your library of images used across your compute resources. Now, many people and organizations might have tens, hundreds, or even more uh, images used across their fleet of EC2 instances. So having a new service that is designed to help simplify the whole process through automation is great news to many organizations. And EC2 Image Builder provides a simplified method of creating, managing, and deploying your images both within AWS, um, so these will be your AMI images that you use, and also images used on premise if you are using MS Hyper-V or VMware VMSphere, or any open virtualization format. Now, when you start using EC2 Image Builder, it follows a set process via a pipeline. Firstly, you need to create a recipe, and this will define the chosen source image and any components to be installed or configured on that image during the build, in addition to any tests that you might want to take place. And then once you have your recipe defined, you need to create a pipeline. And this has an associated IAM role, which has access to create instances with your build, in addition to perform any tests that you might have defined within the recipe. Now, importantly, the pipeline also allows you to schedule how often a new image is created. So if you want to ensure that your images contain the latest security updates and patches, then you can configure it to build a new image from the recipe every single day if required, or every week, or a particular day a month. So you can configure it as, as you see fit. And it can build a new image from the um, recipe every day, which is if security is a, is a high factor, then, then I'll recommend that. And if you want to use this same image or a golden image, as it's sometimes referred to across multiple region, regions, then EC2 Image Builder will allow you to select which regions this is required for distribution. Just one final note on EC2 Image Builder, that it only currently supports Amazon Linux 2 and Windows Server 2012, 2016 and 2019. And again, this service is offered at no additional cost. Next, we have AWS Wavelength. Now, this is currently in preview, so it's not yet generally available. However, this service has been set up to provide ultra low latency down to the single digit millisecond for applications developed on mobile devices using the 5G network. Uh, 
Now these super low latencies are ideal for gaming applications or where live streaming might be required, as well as applications that provide augmented and virtual reality, which is becoming more and more popular as a technology in the, in the industry as we know it. Now essentially wavelengths consists of AWS infrastructure, which is deployed right at the edge of the telecoms provider's 5G network, typically within the provider's data center itself. And this is what helps to maintain the ultra low latency that's required. Now, this infrastructure deployments are called wavelength zones. So all you then need to do is to connect your VPC to these wavelength zones in the required region, and then you're able to use common AWS services, such as EC2, EBS, EKS, IAM, etc to enable you to build your applications. And the elements of your application that need to take advantage of the ultra low latency can be deployed in the wavelength zone right at the edge of the network. Now going forward, wavelength will be incorporated by telecommunication providers such as Verizon, Vodafone, KDDI and SK Telecom, and will be made available in Europe, the US, Japan and Korea. This one I think is a pretty big one. It's provision concurrency for AWS Lambda. And I think uh, if you're doing Lambda, you always heard the term cold start. Uh, the fact that you get a new instance initialized to handle your request. Now, AWS pulled the sleeve and said, from now on, you can provision your own uh, concurrency number of instances, or also known as hyper ready. Uh, it means there is a reserve, or not reserved, a ready instance that's ready to accept uh, incoming requests. You can define as many as you want, uh, as long as your limit uh, of the amount of requests. And then it means that invocation time handling will be reduced uh, drastically. This is obviously, I wouldn't recommend for anyone to do that because it also incurs some uh, additional pricing because you've got, uh, you got this already warmed up. Uh, but in cases where performance is a critical issue or you want to ensure a very low latency of a uh, Lambda function initialization, uh, this is a great uh, scenario. Also worth mentioning that you don't need to change any code whatsoever. It's just a configuration update that you can set on your function and you're just starting to run with it. Okay, now onto storage. <clears throat> starting with S3 access points. Now S3 has a new security feature and this being the access points. And this has been designed to be a new way of securing buckets at scale, while at the same time adding simplification of management to bucket permissions. There are of course already a number of security features for S3 that are used to help control access to buckets such as bucket policies. However, with S3 access points, you now have the ability to configure and set up different access permissions against the shared set of data stored on S3 using multiple access points. And this prevents you from having to manage a single large bucket policy that might contain tens or even hundreds of different statements. And this can get quite complicated over time. Instead, you simply create a different access point for each user, group, service, or application that needs to access that bucket. So for example, let's assume you have a VPC with a group of IAM users who require full access to objects in the bucket. In addition to this, you might have objects in the same bucket or need read-only access from anywhere on the internet. Plus you might have an application that needs access to the objects in that bucket as well. Now you could configure a bucket policy with a number of different statements to help facilitate and manage those access privileges. But with access points, you would simply set up a separate access point with a permission policy for each resource requiring access. Also, as an additional level of security, you can select to restrict access to the access point to originate from a request within a specific VPC or from the internet. It's also important to point out that the actions that can be applied with the policies associated with the access points can only relate to objects within the bucket and not the bucket itself. So you wouldn't be able to add an operation of delete bucket, for example. Next, we have access analyzer for S3. And this is ideal. Sorry, excuse me. This is ideal for those who need a helping hand understanding just what their S3 policies and access control lists are allowing from the outside of your AWS account. So when you first enable the service from within IAM, the S3 access analyzer will automatically appear within your S3 console, and you can review your policies and identify any that might be overly permissive for you to review. 
And this enables you to spot and identify any loopholes of access that you may not have been aware of, allowing you to quickly respond to and remediate the access permission problem. You'll be notified if your bucket has open access to the internet or if it is shared with another AWS account. And when you review your findings, you can either carry out the corrective steps to secure the bucket as it should be, or simply accept the findings if the security is indeed correctly set. Now, as your number of S3 buckets grow, having a security feature such as this to keep tabs of any potential security risk is a much needed and welcomed addition to S3. All too often have we seen the result of overly permissive bucket permissions being set, much to the detriment of organizations who own that bucket and often the customers who have been affected by a data breach. Again, this is another free offering by AWS and it's very simple to implement. Now on to machine learning. Yeah, so this one is for Amplify. It actually falls, you know, in between so many categories because this one uh, is relevant for machine learning, mobile, for analytics, for authentication, and so on. Uh, for those of you who doesn't who don't know, uh, Amplify is an SDK that wraps GraphQL and other AWS services in a single place where you can build almost a complete application without handling any resource, any service, all is abstracted through this SDK. So far, Amplify supported only web and, and uh, React Native uh, libraries. And now, again, AWS helps us to uh, move, take it one step forward uh, towards mobile. So now for iOS and Android, you'll be able to integrate Amplify SDK. Uh, as I mentioned, it really allows faster development because you got built in all the needed features like authentication using Cognito and analytics using the AWS analytics services. AI and machine learning are also included. Any API call using GraphQL and DynamoDBs are also in place and storage. Uh, it's a real-time uh, offering that you can, you know, just plug into your AWS account, start coding through this, some of the SDK libraries, and you get a fully featured service. And now also on your mobile, uh, it includes both iOS and Android. Hi, this is Matt Martinez. So the next feature we have here is contact lens for Amazon Connect. Of course, Amazon Connect is AWS's contact center solution. So what is contact lens? Um, it's a set of machine learning analytics capabilities for Amazon Connect, including things like automatic transcribing, uh, sentiment analysis on conversations, um, and enhanced contact search based on things like keywords and phrases. Uh, so what does this mean for you? Uh, it allows you the ability to understand uh, the sentiments and trends of your, cost, uh, your customer conversations, uh, which will lead to identifying crucial customer feedback and improving your customer service overall. Uh, right now, this feature is in preview. Uh, next, we have SageMaker Studio. So SageMaker Studio is an IDE, or Integrated Development Environment for Machine Learning, built on SageMaker. Um, so what this gives you is a web-based interface where you can perform all kinds of different machine learning development steps. Uh, it gives you a centralized location to build, train, and deploy your models, as well as adjust your experiments, um, compare your model results, and plenty more. Um, so the benefits here are it gives you easy setup of kind of this consolidated machine learning environment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so you'll be able to easily deploy all of your machine learning tools, such as your coding, your visualization, your debugging, uh, your monitoring, and more. Um, and then because you're focused less on building that machine learning pipeline and it's all consolidated for you, uh, that of course will lead to faster iteration of your models. Uh, right now that's available in Ohio. Next we have SageMaker Autopilot. Um, which is a new feature that will automatically train and tune your machine learning models. Uh, and the way this does this is by finding the best combination of data pre-processing steps and then creates your optimal classification and regression machine learning models for you. Um, and then finally, that'll generate some Python code showing you exactly how your data was pre-processed um, so that you can use and tweak that on your own if you need to. Um, some benefits here are it saves you a lot of time because you're not spending any time tweaking your algorithms um, or cleaning or pre-processing your own data, or at least you'll be doing it a lot less. Um, and then you'll also get a lot higher quality for your models um, with hopefully you know, the, uh, the need to scale up a lot less to get there as well. 
um, and that is GA right now. That is available all over. Next, we have SageMaker Model Monitor, um, which is a new feature that will monitor your production machine learning models for deviations. Um, and this will do this by inspecting your collected data and prediction quality and outputs um, reports straight to an S3 bucket for you. Um, Model Monitor will also output per feature metrics to CloudWatch, where you can set up your own alerts and dashboards to track whatever is most important to you. So benefits here are, you know, it'll alert you when you need to take action. So if there's any remedial action you need to take, you'll learn that from Model Monitor. Um, and then, of course, you're going to spend a lot less time troubleshooting because you're going to get those kind of canary in the coal mine situations where Model Monitor is going to, to give you that info right off the bat. Uh, and then, of course, because a lot of this troubleshooting is done for you, it greatly lowers the skill barrier needed to be able to tune and uh, monitor these models. Uh, that's also generally available right now. Next, we have SageMaker Debugger, um, which is a new service that will grant insights into your machine learning model training. Um, and it does this by periodically saving your internal model states, including parameters learned by your model, uh, scalar values, output of each of your layers, and uh, a few more as well. Um, and then it'll apply rules to SageMaker Debugger based on uh, declarations you've made in Python code. Um, you can make your own, and there are pre-built rules uh, available right now as well for some of the most common problems you might run into, uh, like vanishing tensors, vanishing gradients, and several others. So benefits here, um, of course, you're going to capture your training data in real time with no code changes needed or few code changes needed based on those, uh, those rules. Uh, you're going to get alerts when remedial action is needed. And then, of course, um, because a lot of this is getting debugged on the back end for you, you're going to potentially reduce your debug time from days down to potentially minutes. Um, this one's also generally available. And last one here we have is Amazon Code Guru, which is a new AWS developer tool, um, also powered by machine learning. Um, so Code Guru is going to give you a few things, um, including automatic inspection of your source code. Um, and then it'll also run continually in production so that it's tackling code quality from a few different angles. So benefits here. Uh, it's going to automate your code reviews based on uh, millions of lines of Java code written by other developers. And it's going to give you just a wide range of tips on how to improve your code, how to avoid potential issues, and so on. Um, and then once your code is deployed, it'll also run continually in production, and it'll identify problem lines of code for you, um, including resource-intensive lines of code, code uh, that is likely to break, and it'll give you uh, very detailed analysis and uh, actually suggested fixes as well. Um, so you'll get those intelligent recommendations for code fixes and improvements. Uh, right now, it only supports Java projects, but they have other languages in the works. Um, so it's in preview for Java only at the moment. Okay, moving on from machine learning, let's take a look at the analytics announcements. Yeah, so we have pretty exciting uh, announcements from the analytics. Uh, I'll start with the Auto Warm for Amazon Elasticsearch service. This is uh, uh, a feature I would um, I'm, I'm gonna use probably this um, as soon as I can. Since uh, what what they did here is that they um, uh, when when you work with Elasticsearch, so uh, it's it's a very efficient way to uh, index your your data and do some uh, very uh, fast searches and uh, the thing, well, the thing when it starts to become a pain is when you need to have and store a lot, a lot of data. Then it becomes much more expensive because the way Elasticsearch works right now, that you need for each instance, you can only uh, allocate a um, couple of gigabytes per instance. So if you want to uh, scale up, you're gonna need to buy more instances. And this is exactly where they try to decouple um, the different types of services from the storage. They're also gonna do it next with the Redshift. And here with the Elasticsearch, the auto -ROM is just the ability to uh, store uh, up to 10 petabytes of data in a single cluster, and uh, it's all going to be saved on S3. And how they do it is that the auto -ROM is a, a way that they can uh, not only uh, save money on, on the actual um, storage of the data, but also once you want to actually access that from the Elasticsearch service, it's going to be uh, pretty seamless since it's going to be warmed up uh, already by uh, in the background by Amazon. It's, it's a pretty nice feature 
uh, for Amazon to allow you to you, to get some very low low cost and scalable uh, storage, and also um, uh, keep the, the the fast pace of Elasticsearch service. Uh, the next one, uh, the couple of next ones, actually uh, very huge improvements of Redshift. I think uh, in this reinvent, they really focused on how you can um, um, optimize Redshift and how we can use uh, this data warehouse uh, at scale and also um, not worry about the cost. Um, they started off with uh, introducing the RA3 instances. So this is basically instances that um, eliminate the, the, the coupling that you had between storage and compute. So um, previously, if you wanted to scale up sim similar to what you did with the, what you will have done with Elastic, is that if you want to scale up, you also need to scale up in terms of storage, you also need to buy more uh, compute. And if you need to buy more compute and you don't really need to use it, then you're paying uh, for things that you're not really using. So uh, RA3 is not only uh, Improving that way, you can also uh, automatically scale, and it supports workloads of up to uh, eight petabytes. Uh, it also improves the performance and storage by two weeks, which is uh, which is incredible. And um, it's just a way, you know, to optimize uh, your cost and, and not be able to to think about storage and compute uh, and, and think about them separately if you want to to, to support that specific uh, use case. Um, when we think about um, what it did here with separating the storages, then um, at the end of the day, if you're gonna have more storage available to allocate and more compute, sometime uh, um, you're gonna need to have a better approach in actually doing queries. So uh, this announcement of Aqua, I think is very incredible one since uh, they changed the way that you actually run queries. So today to run a query on your Redshift, you will need to take the storage and move it on the network to your compute power. And then that compute power will, will do all the queries. And with the Aqua, uh, the Advanced Query Accelerator, this basically runs um, this basically runs all the queries on the S3 and on the storage itself, which eliminates the need of uh, being able to move the, uh, the data from the network. So this is something that is also improvement in terms of Amazon, their own infrastructure and how they are moving more efficiently, but it also directly hit on the customers. So uh, data can be queried much, much more faster. And um, I think the best thing about this part is, is that 100% compatible with Redshift. So you don't need to make any uh, changes uh, within your queries in order to actually use it. It's just a matter of, of turning on that flag. And, um, uh, and yeah, it's, it comes with all the uh, acceleration of data compression and encryption. And uh, it's just a basically uh, a great way to actually query data without the need to move it uh, to the compute, um, which is awesome. <laughs> and, and the next thing uh, they did is that with Redshift, uh, we would like to uh, run queries today and, and try to query different types of databases and you need to have them all, for example, you're doing some uh, business-related uh, queries what you will need to do is actually run uh, ETL pipelines between different databases in order to get this data to your Redshift and then you could run the query. So um, this new announcement uh, just allows you to run queries across any systems. With Redshift is compatible with RDS and Aurora and this allows you to combine um, uh, live data with the data that you already have running in your data warehouse, um, which um, this is the way that you can uh, run uh, performance uh, and queries on your on your business data. This is another uh, example of how uh, Redshift has become a very powerful tool, and uh, I think the main point of all this announcement is to get people to uh, adopt more Redshift, since it can be very powerful uh, to run business-related uh, data, and uh, I think the more that more, more customers are being using Redshift, are being uh, adding more and more data to, to their own system. So they need the tool that can allow them to actually run uh, sophisticated queries. And with the Redshift Data Lake export, it's just a way to be able to save all the query results in S3 in, 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 in formats like, like Parquet 
And what you can do with this data later on, you can run it on any analytics tool, uh, for example, like Athena, and run on that S3 and also be able to run much more complex queries uh, on that uh, data that you already exported from Redshift. And um, the next announcement is actually, uh, I think it's a game changer and in all that is uh, considered today to be sort of like a marketplace of third-party uh, data. So we have, um, we have many people that need to uh, purchase data from third-party APIs, and we have many providers that have their own data uh, and, and they want to sell it. So today's sort of like an open market and everyone does what he wants. And it can get very, uh, very complex when you think about securing your data and encrypting your data and having any compliance control. So what Amazon did is that they took control on that, on that part and they uh, built AWS Data Exchange. This just allows you to uh, find any, any, any third party data on the cloud using the AWS um, the AWS marketplace. And this is pretty uh, straightforward for uh, providers themselves to reach, uh, I think, millions of people without the need to start marketing their own data. It's all available there. So I think this is a very game changer for people that uh, want to distribute data over the, over the cloud and also uh, for consumers that actually want to use it. Um, and uh, yeah, th those are my announcements for the analytics part. Excellent, thank you very much. <clears throat> Next we move on to application integration. Great, so uh, the first thing coming here is around step functions. I think they're great. They help you orchestrate uh, different kind of scenarios or ETLs or pipelines very easily that someone else like AWS manages. But uh, we found out throughout the time that it's really hard to scale for a very high concurrent ones. I'm talking about very, very high concurrent ones like 100k per second or concurrent uh, ones and sometimes you need a very simple workflow uh, like uh, you know pretty basic etl at a very high scale uh, which run pretty short uh, and it wasn't very cost effective with step functions because the pricing was a bit it didn't give any uh, pricing to scalability or to the duration of the workflow itself but rather to the number of uh, workflows. So here we got Step Functions Express workflows. As it may sound, it's a bit more simple kind of workflow uh, designed for short duration workflows under five minutes, which is actually a pretty good number because you can do a lot in a five minutes uh, workflow. Uh, it's, the concurrency improved drastically. It means that you can run as much uh, as 100K uh, workflows uh, concurrent and the main game changer here is the cost effectiveness of that uh, pricing reduced uh, dramatically uh, for step function express workflows next we got the event bridge schema registry so event bridge itself it's pretty new I think it was announced maybe three or four months ago uh, it allows sharing some kind of event bus between different services or between partners and AWS services to your code, to your uh, services. Uh, so a few things that they've announced on here. So first of all is the ability to uh, get this kind of events that are being streamed on this event bus, the event bridge. Uh, first of all, integrated to our IDEs, currently to VS Code and IntelliJ, and also generate the code binding, bindings for Java, Python, and TypeScript. Uh, it means that it's easier to work with it. It's easier to understand what kind of messages do you get, what are the options, and you know, see it as, part, as an integrated part of our IDE. Also, another cool feature is the schema discovery uh, that you can just turn on. It's obviously cost a bit more money and it's not something that you would turn on forever. Uh, but if you turn it on for maybe a couple minutes, it just scans all kind of messages, all kind of options and values that can be uh, created there and generate this kind of schema, schema for you. So it's much more helpful uh, for you know, understanding what kind of traffic do you see in this event bus. Uh, and also, uh, you got some predefined schemas from partners or AWS services that you can read, some, somewhat like a marketplace for schema uh, that you can uh, sign up for. Uh, next one is the mobile, uh, which also got some really cool features. One of the most significant ones for this reInvent, I think, was uh, the HTTP APIs for API Gateway. 
Uh, as you think of it, and I think anyone can relate to that, uh, API Gateway was too fully featured for most of the use cases and a bit expensive than what we expect for a high-scale uh, endpoint. And that's exactly where Amazon hit us. Uh, a much more simple API Gateway, much better performance at a fraction of the cost. So today, if you'll get, um, if you'll get the new HTTP APIs, it just have a basic integration into either Lambda or another HTTP as a proxy. The performance will be improved to less than 10 milliseconds, which is much better than today's performance. It got no extra features like all the uh, rest of the things that uh, we know of. It's a pretty straightforward API. And cost reduction is amazing. From $3.5 per million request, it down to uh, $1 per million request and even less than that if you're having more and more queries. So this is super fantastic for everyone that is using API Gateway. And another thing in the mobile, so we already discussed about Amplify. Another great thing that really abstracts our way in handling mobile applications or applications in general today is the Amplify data store. As you know, when you're working with a live data from coming from your server, sometimes your connection is being lost. Sometimes there is updates being done on the web or the server side that the clients need to get pushed to that. And you need to maintain some sort of a different store that you control on your own and you need to synchronize it uh, with the server and being able to do delta or auto merge between differences. Here, really, AWS removed all the assholes uh, that we got here. So data store is another built-in thing uh, to the Amplify SDK. It means that you get out of the box this kind of local storage that continuously syncs up uh, against the server, find conflicts, auto-merge them, sync them. Uh, and again, it's powered by part of AppSync and GraphQL. So again, another ab abstraction layer for any kind of developer uh, experience. Okay, finally, I think this is the, the last category, security, identity, and compliance. And we've just got a couple of announcements here. Firstly, the IAM Access Analyzer. Now, this follows on from the previous point I made earlier when I was talking about the S3 Access Analyzer, as it's very much the same thing, but for IAM. Um, they're both designed to identify potential security risks through overly permissive policies. However, the IAM Access Analyzer looks at policies within roles and will identify any risks where access has been granted from outside of your own AWS account. Again, you will be presented with a list of findings for you to review and make any adjustments to policies as you see fit. And again, it's a very useful feature as a safety check to ensure that you have not inadvertently left access open from another account that should not be there. A great design feature of the IAM Access Analyzer is that it allows you to see when the role was last accessed on any given IAM policy and the findings. So you can easily identify and remove unused permissions, helping you to ensure that you are performing housekeeping on your roles and policies. Some of the most common security breaches are made through old and unused policies being left unmonitored. So this should help to resolve such issues where access is allowed from outside of your own account in this instance. And then finally, Amazon Detective. This service is used to help identify the root cause of potential security breaches by enabling you to dive deeper into your service logs, thanks to machine learning coupled with statistical analysis and graph theory to construct a data set identifying where an issue might be located much faster than previously possible with existing AWS services. There are, of course, many other AWS services that are already being used to help you conduct and identify potential security weaknesses and threats, such as Amazon Macy, Amazon Guard Duty, and of course, the AWS Security Hub. However, Amazon Detective now provides a means of investigating these issues at a far greater level, enabling you to pinpoint exactly where an issue might be originating from. It can analyze literally trillions of events from all different logs, such as your CloudTrail logs or your VPC flow logs, and also any findings from Amazon Guard Duty as well. And then th these are displayed in a set of results in a behavior graph, allowing you to understand the interactions between them. And this helps you, again, to identify the root cause of any security risk you might have. So in a nutshell, Amazon Detective is a great way to triage security findings, conduct incident investigation, and perform proactive threat hunting within your infrastructure. 
So I think that's brought us to the end of a number of now announcements. I think there's approximately 30. So, so thanks everyone for, for those insights. Um, I just have a, a quick question to each of you. Which was your, your kind of favorite announcement from reInvent this year? I think I'll start. Uh, I do have some interesting ones, but actually some that we haven't mentioned. And I think there is a website that you can probably go through all the hundreds of releases and announcements that there have been, but we try to pick some of them. Uh, and it's actually this one is part of a uh, Werner Vogel's uh, keynote uh, okay. where they gave us some intro to how things working behind the scenes for them uh, with Nitro and all the things, you know, backend infrastructure stuff that they're running. Uh, one of them was the uh, announcement for the uh, uh, EKS Fargate support, uh, which they showed a really great example how EKS compared between Fargate and the regular instances really changes uh, the game in terms of uh, under, overscale and underscale. Like it quickly scales uh, when you and very quickly uh, downscale when you don't need extra instances. This was super amazing. And again, I think. AWS really doing a great job in infrastructure work for all of us, so we won't need to uh, handle all these kind of things. Yeah, yeah. That, that, is a, that is a good benefit. <laughs> yeah, and I, uh, I uh, personally, I really like the provision concurrency for Lambdas, um, simply because uh, you know cold start has been like uh, something that all all talk about and try to see how they can actually monitor that, and I know a lot of people actually been waiting for such a solution to be able to um, be sure that you can use Lambda because Lambda is, is so easy to use and it's gonna accelerate your developer velocity once you develop that. But when it comes with a price that you don't really know uh, that randomly sometime you're gonna wait for cold start and you don't have a way to manage that. So that was a very huge pain for uh, more people that I know. Uh, and I really liked uh, how they approach it with the provision concurrency. It's something I've been waiting for uh, for a while. For a long time. <laughs> How about from yourself, Matt? Sure. So, you know, I don't know if it's necessarily going to be the most impactful update released uh, this year, but, you know, coming from a developer background, my personal favorite thing to come out this year was Code Guru. Uh, I'm very excited about that. You know, just having the benefit of being able to, you know, lean on the mistakes already made and the hard lessons already learned. Uh, by, you know, dozens or hundreds or thousands of developers before me, um, all powered by a machine learning, you know, easily automated environment in AWS is just going to be fantastic. I think it's going to speed up a lot of workflows. Uh, and I think it's going to lead to, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of lines of better code in the long run for many, many companies. I'm, I'm thrilled to get to work with CodeGuru. Nice. Well, I hope going forward, um, leading into 2020, Matt, that you can create some labs on on code guru and many of the other services we we've already discussed so i mean i i certainly look forward to creating <laughs> yeah i certainly look forward to creating a, a number of courses on a lot of these annou announcements uh, leading into 2020 so so please keep a look out for any new labs uh, and new courses that are focused on the, the services that we mentioned today we've got a couple of other questions uh, if you guys got time um, firstly, how can you configure the provisioned concurrency for Lambda? So this one is a pretty basic one. As I mentioned, you don't need to do anything in terms of the code change. And the way it works, if you'll get into the AWS console right now, you'll be able to see another section called provision concurrency uh, under your Lambda console. Uh, in order to configure that, you need to set up a specific version of your Lambda. So if you're running on the default settings, uh, it means that you're running on latest. Uh, in order to run provision concurrency, you need to create a specific version of your function. Again, it can be the latest one, but it just need to be versioned. And then you can just control it. You can define as many as you want. For example, one uh, provision concurrency or 100 or as many as you want. Once you do that, it takes some time to spin them up. Uh, it takes roughly between, I know, 30 seconds to 60 seconds to take all of them up and then they're hyper ready for your request. Also, once you're doing it, you're getting a new kind of metric, uh, so actually some new metrics, but the most important one to watch is the provision concurrency utilization. It tells you on a scale like percentage from zero to 100 at any time frame how much of your provision concurrency uh, was being utilized. So 
hopefully you want to get close to 100 but not uh, not 100 because then it means that you're doing not the provision concurrency and on the other end you don't want to be on the zero side because it means that you're not utilizing nothing from uh, the provision sure. concurrency so it's pretty simple okay thank you um we've got just another couple of questions uh, next uh, that's come in here. is the rds proxy easy to set up when working with lambda functions yeah, so basically, if you want to get started with, with the Amazon RDS proxy, it's just a matter of a couple of clicks. Um, <clears throat> it's really easy to just go to your existing RDSs and just uh, tap the flag on enabling and creating a proxy. And um, so the, the RDS proxy actually simplifies the way that you need to manage any connection pools or things like that, but it's also much easier to set up. So uh, if you have currently Lambda functions that are communicating with uh, with the RDS, you can just go and delete all the code that handles all the connections, and instead of uh, using your current RDS endpoint, you just point it to the proxy one, and everything just works seamlessly. Excellent, thank you. Um, and one final question, I think this one might be um, heading your direction, Matt. Um, how does Amazon Code Guru Profiler work? Oh, fantastic. I get to talk about Code Guru already. Awesome. Okay, so, um, you know, I don't think we explained it well enough, but Code Guru um, is two kind of separate features. So there's Code Guru Reviewer um, and Code Guru Profiler. Reviewer is the one that's going to look at your source code and give you recommendations there. Profiler is the part of Code Guru that's going to run in your production application and give you recommendations there. So the way it works is it's got three different pieces. Um, there's an agent the profiler service and the intelligent recommendation uh, service. So the agent is just an in-process thread um, that you'll install as part of your application, which takes data from your instances um, and sends that to the profiler every five minutes, uh, which will aggregate that data um, and then send it on to the intelligent recommendation uh, piece. And that intelligent recommendation piece is going to be the part that will um, it'll give you interactive flame graphs that you can use to visualize uh, the performance of your application, and then also um, scan that data and gives you, you know, uh, proactive best practice alerts and recommendations on what to do with your code. Excellent. Thank you very much, Matt. So that now brings us to the, the end of the webinar. There's no more questions that have come in. So just a, a couple more points from myself. Um, everyone will receive a copy of this webinar um, as soon as it becomes available. Um, I just want to thank everyone for joining today and obviously to all the panelists, Ran, Hen and Matt. It's been, it's been great speaking to you guys and getting an insight on, on some of the announcements that you were kind of interested in. So thank you very much um, for that. Um, and finally, I, I think this is my last webinar of the year. So to everyone, uh, to the panelists and also everyone listening, uh, I wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I'll speak to you all again soon. Any final words from anyone else? No, this has been really great. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye.